Thanks for joining us at Colts to Consciousness. This storytelling podcast is meant to be for entertainment purposes only and does not substitute for any medical advice. We may discuss triggering topics and we ask that you make your personal mental health a priority. Lastly, the opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the host. Hey everyone, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and find independence and healing through awareness mm. and true individual sovereignty. So today I am so excited to be joined by the infamous Kara Burrell slash Nuance Ho. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. And just even that that introduction of the new podcast, those words of just the sovereignty. I'm like, oh, those all speak to my soul already. Let's get into it. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad. Yeah, Kara, I mean, you are a huge voice in the ex-Mormon community. You have some hilarious ex-Mormon content. <laughs> and you are not new to the space of podcasting or helping others find their own sovereignty through laughter and levity, which is why I wanted to bring you on because you're hilarious and you're blunt and you're to the point. And I think more people need to hear from people like you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And I owe it all to other people in the post-Mormon podcasting space who have come before me. And literally, it's just when you see somebody else put themselves out there, you think, hey, that's making me feel so much better. They're, I'm connecting with them. You get to a space where you're able to uh, finally have some things to say. And we all are just like this cute little, you know, these cute little munchkins that are all running around just like gobbling up all of the sweet, sweet, like little nectar from different people that we agree with, you know? So like... You've got some nectar. I've got some nectar. We've all just got all these. Everyone has just good pieces in this post-Mormon community. And I'm just happy to be one of them. That's all I'm trying to say. So I benefit so much from other people, too. Yeah. I think that was the best visual that I've ever, <laughs> ever seen. It's like all these little things just like, give me all the nums. So yeah. that's what we want to do here. We want to pretty much give people hope that if you woke up one day and realized that you're in a very culty religion or a cult of any kind it doesn't even have to be religion that there is hope for you and there's ways to kind of wiggle yourself out and to find all the the nom noms from other people who have come before you so that's what we're here to do um but mostly i just want to start with your story um however much you want to share get as deep and grimy as you want mm. um it's up to you so so tell us about your background Okay, just I'm going to launch into it. Um, this is like the spiel, you know, like people ask, what's your kind of Mormon story? That's what you want. Yeah. Okay, this is what you're going to get. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cut me off if I go too long. I'll try to talk as fast as I can. I'm used to TikTok, you know, I got to get it out there. So this will be 60 seconds. Just kidding. Um, so my parents are converts to the church from back east. My dad comes from a big Catholic family of 10 kids, and he was right in the middle. My mom comes from just like a semi-religious, um, uh, non-religious type family. Lots of interesting other stories in their background of what led them to joining the church, but they did. So my mom joined the church on her own when she was 12, and my dad when he was around 24. And the reasons that they joined the church, you know, just a lot of trauma, a lot of reasons that obviously go into why somebody seeks after the cult mentality of what it can offer. And so for all intents and purposes, I am grateful that my parents had the support of the Mormon church in the times that they needed it. And um, while still recognizing that there's a lot of unhealthy aspects that they glom onto, but who knows where they would be without the community and the structure. So um, my oldest brother is deaf and has Asperger's and just was never really set up for living a healthy life. And my parents also just not trying their best, but just never really in a situation um, where he could thrive. And so since he was the oldest, taking up a lot of attention, I'm the youngest of five kids. And so a lot of our life when I was younger, um, was really, really hectic and chaotic and a lot of screaming and a lot of meltdowns and stuff in my house. And so any kind of like picture perfect idea of like, uh, you know, a pioneer stock family or anything like that, my family was the opposite. 
and just a lot of a lot of drama overall. And so I, being the youngest, needing attention, <laughs> needing people to know that I exist, um, I I obviously at a young age like learn how to use my comedic spirits to make my older siblings laugh. And there is this part of a Chris Farley documentary that came out recently that I always think of um, where he t- his old, his brothers, now that he's passed away, his brothers are sitting around a table talking about just the environment that they grew up in and just like Chris Farley being like the clown of the clowns of the family. And like, you have like your harshest critics, but then your biggest fans are also your family. So just like trial by fire, like refiner's fire <laughs> kind of stuff is how my siblings treated me. Like they did not laugh unless I was genuinely funny. So I like to chalk it up that like everything about my sense of humor was also in this furnace of just a lot of, a lot of chaos. And then me and my sister growing, my, me and my older sister growing really close, her being my, my audience, like still to this day, like every story I tell her, it's just, just her like with her arms folded, like waiting (laughs) to like make me laugh, like, you know, court jester kind of thing. So um, we moved. So that was just kind of the environment that I grew up in, but we didn't have any churches close by. We had to drive like 30 minutes just to go to our ward building when we lived in Ohio. Um, but so my mom, obviously she's like a stressed out um, parent with five kids and no like LDS community um, living in this small town. That's my dad's small town in Ohio. Um, and which I'm actually going to go visit um, on Wednesday for my cousin's wedding. And I never get to go back there. So this town has a very uh uh, like you know sweet place in my heart because I was I was kind of ripped ripped from all of my cousins and all of my family living back there um and my mom moved us out to Arizona for three years and then um eventually to Utah and it was when I was eight and we started living in Utah that I really got like that full Mormon experience of just um like Provo Utah nothing like it um <laughs> and uh, yeah, f- so fully immersed, like uh, night and day, even though where we lived in, in Arizona for a while was still very Mormon. There's nothing like it. And so um, I really was grateful and I had a great experience in young women's like, you know, all around. I have you, there's there's crazy leaders that say things and there's um, certain lessons that I could have lived without. But overall, like I loved my ward growing up. It was like a real fun family. I missed it. Like after I got married, I just, I cried. <laughs> I cried as like a young married woman, eventually missing like the home ward that I grew up in. I wish I could still live with my parents and like go to my ward. Like that's how much these leaders that raised me, um, just raised me with a good head on my shoulders, encouraged my comedy. And um, I had overall like a pretty positive experience and not um, a whole lot of trauma that, you know, a lot of other people with like creepy bishops or um, I kept the rules. I had good friends. I went to Timfew high school is just like this all American high school. I don't know how else to describe it. Like good friends, just like laughing while we have sleepovers on the weekend. Sober as can be. And I loved the church and um, I sleepovers with my friends. I would like, I have, (laughs) I, I was, I was still like a horny little teenager of all my friends. Like we still talked about sex. I mean, and so I feel like we right? got that out. <laughs> yeah. But like, so I, I didn't realize how, I didn't realize how unique my Mormon experience was in certain ways where like me and my friends were not, uh, prodded to really feel guilty about things that now I recognize a lot of other people would feel guilty about, like, whether it be like, like we didn't do it. It's, you know, there's lines that you don't cross and lines you do cross, but like talking about sex, like long conversations about what what we're going to do with our husbands on our wedding night and like what our honeymoons are going to be like. <laughs> Hour long discussions, details, no, no like stone unturned kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> and like still feeling like we we were, you know, we didn't need to be feminists in the church. We didn't need to have a voice because all of our needs are met still. This is Christ one true church. So um, there's there's also just the aspect of like, a certain now I recognize a certain amount of um, church attendance and adherence to the rules and the gospel is to just kind of make your parents 
not any more frightful and fearful of your future when my mom always called me like, Kara, you're such a wild child, knowing that my mom already kind of pinned me as I was going to be the wild one and kind of wanting to prove her wrong of like, I'll be wild, like in certain ways, like I'll have like, you know, comedy. I did like a bunch of comedy songwriting and stuff that was like kind of my niche, like through my teen years. And, um, my, my mom kind of needing, (laughs) needing a break from so many crazy kids because my brother is so difficult to handle sometimes all the time and just really wanting to perform and be like a good child while still being unique in my own way. So um, I hope that kind of gives you like the picture <coughs> um, of like I was in it. I had a good experience. Um, definitely really believed it. Um, and had hardly nothing on the shelf whatsoever. Um, and a lot of that was wrapped in like, yes, that elevated emotion, these, this communal conversion that you kind of get, um, through girls camp and through all of your young women's activities and just not wanting to disappoint your leaders and, uh, feeling like this is a healthy, good, positive way to live being my own little apologist on the internet, any ways that I could. So if anyone wants to know like kind of how old I am, I was, I was, Yes. Okay. Please interrupt. Yeah. So, so knowing who you are, and I, and I'm curious to know if you feel like your personality is the same, or if now that you've left, you've kind of blossomed into more of who you are. But knowing how you're so like forthcoming and you ask questions and you're very blunt and straightforward, I'm wondering if you hadn't grown up in such an immersive environment like Provo, if you maybe would have asked more questions. And kind of try to get to the bottom of those answers sooner. Probably not. Um, I was so fearful of falling off the deep end. I always just associated, you know, the the cognitive dissonance where you feel that when you're younger a little bit. And you recognize that, like, if I keep asking these questions, that's going to be associated with me becoming probably more nuanced. And then probably feeling more of a license to break rules and I already have a propensity to want to break rules. So I need to stay on the path as much as possible. Um, but yeah, like I, (laughs) I, I like in the same way that now, like I like explaining concepts and I like talking with people. I like to do that just about the way that the gospel made sense to me. And anytime I could bring it back to like, the love I felt from my savior, Jesus Christ. And then you get, again, there's just a certain level of, uh, communal, like, uh, it's like an elevated emotion communally. (laughs) I don't also describe it of when you're, when you're at girls camp or you're at young women's and you're a leader in your community for having the strongest testimony, I guess is like, that is, that is what I knew that my, my heart and soul needed at that time. And I'm all about just like what gets you through life at through the stages that you need to, um, you know, you can only have certain pieces of, of, and particles of truth and knowledge about yourself. And sometimes that's all you have to get you through. So that's, that's that period of my life. And if I may get so vulnerable, please, um, uh, if I may get so vulnerable with you, girl, uh, everything is anytime you have childhood trauma, as I did from having, uh, years and years of sexual abuse, um, it just paints your brain in so many skiddly wampus ways. <laughs> and so some people, they go off the deep end into addiction to kind of numb their pain, or they go ultra religious and they become like, you know, extra prudish or something. Um, I, for whatever reason, I just knew that the church was going to keep me um, on the straight and narrow And, um, like I said, I didn't want to experiment too far off into too many lanes because I knew what was lying on the other end of that. So I'm trying to remember as many stories as I can because explaining concepts or memories is not as interesting. So like, for instance, if I may get so vulnerable, I remember, I remember when I was 12 years old, I had a bunch of little guy friends. I was like a little tomboy when I was a kid, but like tomboy, but straight, like not like tomboy that grew up into a lesbian. So tomboy, but like still wanted to make out with them. (laughs) And um, I remember laying in my bed at 12 years old, really analyzing my life and thinking that 
I said in my head to myself that if it wasn't for the church, I think I would have lost my virginity by now. Yeah, I definitely would have. Like I'd made out with all the boys. I did as, I did as many things as I possibly could. I remember thinking like I would have if I didn't like have like a God that I was praying to that I knew that he didn't want that for my life. And he had a husband that was going to treat me well and like dedicate his life to me one day. So a lot of um, the conditioning that went into, again, cults, they serve a purpose, right? So like a lot of the conditioning to, that went into um, the way that my brain formed was that like the, the formula that like I have, I have, I have this sexuality that I have, I'm coming to terms with. And what I mean by that is just like that it exists, <laughs> <laughs> that like the, the spark has been awakened and I'd like to have sex and I'd like to have it with only people who are going to respect my body is kind of how I started forming this as a kid of like, I want this to be mine. When somebody else touches it, I want to be able to trust them and I want to do it in a safe environment. Even though it's great, I just, I don't like feeling unsafe when I'm in a with sexuality, obviously. Right. And so it just meant that if I'm ever going to have sex, I have to, a a worthy priesthood holder is the formula staying in the church. That type of man is the only man that will ever, um, respect my body. Obviously that's not true, (laughs) but that's the story that I was told. And that's the way my brain made sense of things. And so, um, my path was set from then to just be, be good, be in the church, be attractive as much Mm -hmm. as you can. Awkward teen years. Those are what they are. (laughs) But my life pursuit was to get a husband who would love and respect me as soon as possible. Like preferably before I turned 20 was pretty much the goal. Um, We have like a very parallel childhood. I mean, obviously we grew up in the same cult, but (laughs) um, I also went through sexual abuse as a child. mm. I was also very like follow the rules. I I, I need to make sure that I'm staying on the one true path and uh, everything that you were saying about um being too afraid to dip too many toes in the water of sin is like that behavioral right. control like they they get you with fear and tell you well if you if you put a whole foot in that that water of sin like you could drown so don't do that and yeah so it was very very similar with me and with boys and similarly when i was 12 i remember um i had my first kiss when i was 12 and immediately felt so much guilt just like right away I was like oh my gosh I'm sexual sinner and and then my mom one day we're driving home from school and she just looked at me and she goes you know I'm just so proud of you Shalise and you're just like such a good girl and you never break the rules and I was like oh my gosh she knows oh my gosh like the guilt was so heavy just from kissing a boy and I think it's just it's really sad that that organizations, religions put that type of shame and guilt on these young children. I mean, we were children. And so, yeah, I mean, the programming, it runs really, really deep. But like you as well, I I thought I had a great relationship with the church and everything was awesome. And no, I don't have any trauma. And now 10 years after leaving mm-hmm. the church, I'm still like peeling these layers. I'm like, oh, that's why I'm this way. Oh, that's why I don't right. like this. And it's like, ah, like, when am I going to get to the core of me and and stop peeling back layers of Mormonism exactly. that weren't mine? <laughs> Girl, yes, yes, every yes. single day. Um, yeah, speaking of, like, just peeling back layers, it is so much fun, though, to be able to do it with other people who are just, that's their whole life goal. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I know people say like, leave the church, leave it alone or whatever. And I'm like, sometimes people do need to leave it alone because they've peeled back all of the layers maybe in there for what their pursuits in life are, you know? But I'm like, I just love, I love, love, love that you get that concept. I know you would just like everything. I, I don't want to be one of those people who blame the church for everything because so, so much of the, there's good in those peeling back layers. There are reasons why I am the way I am um, that were helpful and, like I, I, I got through hard times in my life because of the prayers that I said and the scriptures that I found right. and like the seminary teachers who gave me guidance, right? Like all of that stuff. I am the new one. like all of that stuff to the side, but they're peeling back layers of like what you said at the beginning, like that ownership and like that self sovereignty is like the exact kick that I'm on right now of who am I outside of who I was conditioned to be for 
a man right? <laughs> who's a lovely man. There's nothing against him, but like the system in which that told me that my sexuality needed to be this way and confined in this way and that my pursuits should be this and everything that's gone into shaping our little minds into what's good and bad. And then you have so much un effing of your brain to be like, who would I have been without all of that? Who, if I would have been in a family who, ex- it, who was focused on um, just being like the gardener of like, <laughs> like a, a child that's growing in a garden. Sorry. I'm having all these like nectary garden uh, <laughs> weird like- uh, metaphors right now, like tending to something and like helping it grow. Yeah. I'm just looking at all your plants right now. Like, Like instead of something that just was kind of put in a box and told like you have to be shaped in this way over and over and over again. Like like that cult conditioning of like reshape yourself every day to fit within this this box instead of being able to like flourish in your own ways with parents that just like provide barriers and guidance. I think about that all the time now because I'm like I'm really coming to terms with who I am um, and what my dreams and pursuits would have been. And that's kind of heartbreaking to realize that when you're like fudge. I'm 33. I wish I could have known that when I was like ready to set my sights on the big brand new world when I was like graduating high school or something. But yeah, I totally get that. And, and I think actually your visual is spot on. I I was picturing a, a small box and you plant a seed in a box, but the roots can only go within the confines of that box. And yeah. so you literally fit yourself into a square mold. And so now what I'm curious about is at what point did your roots break open that box and you're like, oh, there's a world out here and there's so many things that I didn't realize and uncovering the the real history of the church. And because you go deep into a lot of church doctrine and church history and in your videos, which I love, I'm like eating up all this information. I think I know more about <laughs> Mormonism. I mean, you probably feel the same way than like 90% of Mormons out there because of all the research that I've been doing because it's so interesting for one. And also, I don't know if I need more fuel to the fire, but every now and then it's nice to like throw some gasoline on it and be like, yeah, Yeah. all right, cool. (laughs) Like, I'm glad that I got out of there. (laughs) I know if you ever are like struggling to create content, you have to watch something that kind of triggers you. And like your brain starts racing with like all these argumentations and stuff. That's what I do. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, now I'm just like, I didn't feel like even talking about Mormonism ever again. And I was like, but there's so much bullshit. <laughs> I was like, there's still so much bullshit to talk about. I never could run out of it. It's true. So, so when did that change for you? Okay. I'm going to, uh, let's, I want to, that's a, obviously a great question, but I feel like it'd be incomplete if I didn't answer it by starting with just the, the roots that I think so many people uh, understand and agree with. And it's. Cause so when you're, when you're Mormon and people are throwing different stuff at you, but I was so conditioned to be so conservative that like, you know, telling people that I should care about like not having a voice in the church and like ordained women stuff, like none of that led to any more consciousness because I was so conditioned to, um, uh, to just realize this is my plight in life as a woman and we have different gender roles in the church. And so I had my, my conscious awareness, to be honest, came from a place of valuing what the church told me to value. And then over time, recognizing that the church that I was taught to in which to, that taught me how to value those things, wasn't valuing them. And one of the biggest ones was recognizing at like 17 or 18, that I could go three hours of church and nobody was talking about Jesus Christ once. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Thank like you. not, not a testimony, not a nothing. And I was like, n- none of this has a point until we talk about our relationship to the very God that we were yeah. worshiping. Everything felt like it was a conversion to Joseph Smith and like so many doctrines. Mormonism has so much history to go over. Like you can have an entire year where you're just talking about like lessons from Heber C. Kimball and like who gives enough, you know, like nothing it felt like was really getting to that root of what I felt like was the highest level of spirituality of like, let's just talk about like what Jesus said and what he did and how that's going to spark my, uh, my spirituality for the week that I want to be more like Christ. Like all of the lessons, all of the things we were doing did not make me really feel like I was going to be a better person. And I started recognizing at 17, 18, I could read a book 
like a, a regular Christian book about, you know, Christ teachings, whatever, um, in the hallway. And I would probably have a much better experience over those three hours than trying to like, you know, uh, squeeze, squeeze the juice out of this. And once my, one of the biggest parts of my, my life (laughs) is just a huge codependency with my older sister and it's the best of times and sometimes it's the worst of times. So just, just imagine a copy of me who's a lot more into gardening and (laughs) hippie stuff than me, but laugh at the same jokes, have the same way we throw our head back, just the exact same person. And so she was a lot more religious than me. Um, even growing up, just totally follow the rules to a T, um, like blood in her shoes, walking on her mission, just like serving for the Lord. Um, never in a million gazillion years would I ever think that she would leave the church. I've never seen anyone before since literally live the church more exactly. But obviously then there's the, why is somebody living the church so exact? There's reasons that the church, you know what I mean? Like (laughs) the reason why somebody lives with such stringent orthodoxy is probably because they're trying to squeeze something out of it that then they can't actually get out of it. And they recognize that, that, that spiritual different difference in themselves. And then they go crazy. So anyway, she left the church in like 2012 and it totally blew my world open. And from her leaving the church, she didn't want to talk about it. She was on her own, like new age spiritual journey. Um, and it, it rocked my world. And so from that point on, I had to figure out what I really believed. And so I went back to basics with trying to learn about Jesus Christ, trying to like sure up my testimony in the ways that I always wanted to. But now I had like a really good motivation because I was like, don't let me like her, don't leave the church or like try to get her back or something like just read. Um, and so the more um, I I read these books about Jesus Christ and I listened to these really awesome sermons that I still love to this day. Um And I heard people talking about Jesus Christ in a way that my soul had always yearned for, you know, people talking about just like the basics of what he came to do, how he came to set you free. So many things that are just universal truths um, and just about self-sacrifice, but in, in the best ways, I feel like. And I, I went through this Jesus freak phase for like seven years from that point on where if I was listening to something, it wasn't a conference talk from church. It was one of like my favorite pastor's sermons. And they, mm-hmm. that was the, that was the spiritual like hunger that was being satisfied that I always had. And so my first moments of waking up was again, like coming into the fact that the church wants me, the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, the only way I will survive within this church is if I have like a DIY version of how I'm going to do this church. And if they're going to ask me to serve, a, do a lesson, I will not do it unless we're talking about Jesus Christ or some kind of way that we're talking about a radical love that just flips your whole world yeah. up and down. You know what I mean? Like, like I want a teacher to come into Sunday school and tell me how they're going to fucking ruin my life because all of my habits are entrenched in just self-serving sin. And I want them to tell me how Jesus came to set me free. And if you trust (laughs) in him, give your life over to him. Like you will just like rest in the peace that he has you like just hardcore. Tell me the truth that like I suck and Jesus has got me and to try better every day. Like it sounds a little dogmatic the way I describe it now, but it like was (laughs) for those seven years, it was just like, Every day, I was just like this love, this where you're just in that relationship with Jesus that like evangelicals talk yeah. about. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. as I went through went through that, it was a, it was the happiest times of my life. Um, but um, at the end of the day, I was still living it within the confines of Mormonism. I was still had a calling. I was still going to church. I was still a Mormon person, while secretly like every single lesson, I'm like, kill me now. Like I hated, (laughs) I just figured this is the only way I could really raise my kids. This is the only way that they'll be productive and happy is if we still follow the word of wisdom, we still follow these rules while I'm also living personally in my own spirituality, a very different radical, like radical version of like this, like very, you know, big expansive love. And then the other piece of it, it was that I was such not a feminist back then. I like called myself an anti-feminist because I was so, I I really just, I could, I was like, girls, we got some rights now. It's time to shut up because the men are suffering. (laughs) (laughs) And to a certain extent, like today, I still, I still think that like, we have, we have to talk about trauma wherever it comes from, from the church. And so my, 
what's what seriously started waking me up as I have a, a short TikTok about this that I put up like a week ago about one of the first things that woke me up was I, I was like, I didn't have any trauma in the church, but my husband, he, um, he, I was awakened to his trauma. Like he had all different kinds of like sexual repression and he like only masturbated once, like his entire life <laughs> like, before serving a mission. Like he was, he was, he was told he was going to hell. He literally associated masturbation with going to hell. Like you imagine the pressure of a 19 year old kid never once touching their wiener. Like that means you're kind of fucked up in the head. Like at that point. Right. And I'm on the opposite sa- side. I was masturbating like 12 times a day in eighth grade. I didn't give a fuck. You know, <laughs> like I was like, Oh no, sweet, sweet baby child. I was like, you don't, you're not going to hell. You won't. Cause I was just raised by a different set of leaders who gave me a different set of like what God cares about, what he doesn't care about kind of stuff. And he had, he had more of like the Orthodox ones that were fire and brimstone teaching. And so he, that, and then, you know, him having to always be the breadwinner in the house. I was never like raised th- with this idea that I was ever going to college. And my parents were truck drivers and had different, like, you know, semi failed businesses and stuff growing up. Like I never even had the money, let alone the ambition to go to college. And here's my husband, all of his life is just forced into that. You're going to have a big family, whether you want to or not. Kind of. And this is your role as a priesthood holder. So just the, I was more awakened to how much the church was hurting him. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we have a lot of like in the comedy scene, um, a lot of gay friends and with enough exposure over time, you you recognize how many people didn't have good experiences in the church. So I first had to awaken. So it was, it was literally my my conservative like values <laughs> that propped up my husband as like the priesthood like authority figure made me more keen and aware to listen to his struggles. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I was more primed to care about him wanting to leave the church first before me because he's more in tune with God. Like, isn't that strange? But like, you have to use the tools that are (laughs) given to you in Mormonism. (laughs) And one of them is like priesthood authority. So those are the first kind of just wave of awakening that something's off within this, with, within this church. So by the time I like kind of read everything that's in the CES letter and really had to make a clean break with the church, that was, summer 2019. And um, it was devastating and horrible. And I wish none of that pain on anyone. So there's probably a lot of people that don't know what the CES letter is. It's basically, it was this guy, I mean, maybe you could tell better than I can, that just asked all these questions to the church. It was like, what, over 150 pages long or something? Yeah. Um, Jeremy Reynolds, I don't know how long it is. Um, uh, Letter to a CES director believe is the name of it, but it is the one-stop shop for all of the problems in the church. Um, and I believe with links that lead you back to church approved resources, it's been a while since I read it, but there's a lot of different things that have been collected over the years. Um, that's just probably the most famous one of all of the most problematic places of church history. Um, but you, it's like, it's like a one piece of a puzzle you could say by like the book of Abraham completely being, you know, made up and not at all what Joseph Smith said that it was. There's, there's, there's a thousand different pieces of part of this ES letter, thousand different pieces that are a uh, part of church history. One alone can disprove that the church is what it says it is. And you put them all together in a collection and it just, it, it's insane how everything's been hidden from you, you know? And so some people read it all in one night and they go, oh my God, so this is a not true thing. I was, I was led to believe that it was actually true. Come to find out this, if this is true, what that was, was not true. So. Right. Do you remember specifically any, any of those points that stood out to you? Like the book of Abraham where you're like, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. This definitely like I'm out, but I'll keep reading anyway. Did you have any of those yeah. moments? Yeah. Um, Book of Abraham was the big one. And there was like an hour long documentary that I watched um, on YouTube all about it. And then I went and like checked on as many websites as I could. And I remember going to like Fair Mormon, which is like the apologetics arm of like, okay, so you're telling me that Joseph Smith said that he got these scrolls from this mummy, this papyrus. And he said that this was written by the hand of Abraham. And it turns out these are just basic funerary texts. If this is what you're telling me, then um, 
the entire scripture that I memorize, I still can recite like, like <laughs> scripture masteries that I remember like loving, you know, I'm like, you're telling me that I was told in seminary that that's what it was. It was this papyrus. And it just so happens that this is not just from Egypt, but from like the father of all like major religions, patriarch of all Abraham. This was written by his own hand that got into Joseph Smith's hands. Wow. But it turns out not that way. I don't know how I'm going to recover from that because now we can, now we can see what that papyrus says. And it's not at all what Joseph said that it was not even the word Abraham's on. It has not a thing to do written in a different time period, different part of the world. And if he said it was a direct translation, that's going to be a real problem. And you put that together with all of the parts of the book of Mormon um, that just have anachronisms and are borrowed and remixed from other things that were contemporary to his day. Just straight up passages from King James ver version of the Bible, just copy pasted right in there. Deuteronomy, <laughs> Isaiah, I'm preaching to the choir at this point. And you're just like, okay, so nothing he actually created can actually stand up to any kind of scholarship. Oh, wow. Okay. This is going to be a, this is going to be a big problem in my life. I can't, I can't recover from this. And I remember reading about the polygamy and stuff and it feels like there's I can nuance away a lot of the problems. The thing I could not, I just need the facts. I'm like, the fact of the matter is, is he said it was this way. And now we can prove, I mean, it's looking at all of the places that he, you know, borrowed from to even create the Book of Mormon. I was like, there's no working your way out of this tunnel here. Like if you care, if you try to stay in this church a moment longer, if I try, I haven't walked into a church building since. Cause I'm like, if I sit around people who don't know this information of how we got these books, like I didn't last week, I will just start screaming. If I go into a church building, I was like, I will be unsafe around all of these people because <laughs> we have all been bamboozled. And I feel like I need to, I, I wasn't going to tell the world yet. I was still in that, you know, early phase of like the church gave me a lot of good things and I'm happy. And, you know, I just, it just lied to me syst systemically for my entire life um, on purpose in every way, at every corner they, but I'll, I'll deal with that anger in a second. I just need to deal with what am I going to do with my life now? Yeah, that was very similar to me. Um, the book of Abraham. So I, I left before the CES letter existed. So it seemed like back in the day when websites were just weird and clunky with like bright purple backgrounds and like you didn't really know if it was true or not. It's like, oh, is this just like ex-Mormon rhetoric? You know how they say. Um, but I remember finding the Book of Abraham thing and I'm like, oh, well, if he made that up, he made the rest of it up. And I was like, cool. But then I kept looking around just for funsies. And then I saw the multiple versions of the first vision and I was like, oh, yeah, he made that up, too, then. <laughs> like, it's a, but it it's was, a made up religion. But the other ones, there's got to at least probably be one real one. <laughs> it's just made up. So, um, yeah, I remember I moved from Las Vegas to California here. And I was so desperate to have, to meet friends because I didn't know anybody here that I went to church and I sat down and same thing. None of the lessons were about Jesus. And it was in that moment that I realized it. I was like, they really don't care about God. Like the only time they say Jesus is in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Exactly. <laughs> How is this a religion? And I was sitting through because it's a singles ward, which is even more like oh, it's just painful because they really go in on the chastity stuff and mm. and the temple worthiness. And the lesson was all about temple worthiness. And I was fuming, Kara. I was like ready to stand up just like you said and be like, are you guys hearing yourself? Because yep. once the goggles come off, like everything is so clear. And I realized in that moment, I cannot come back to a church ever. I would rather just walk down the street and be like, hi, do you want to be my friend? Than sit in a church building to try and make friends. Like, I could not do it. I could not do it. Yep. Yep. And like, you don't know where you're going to make friends. You don't know what your life is going to be. But it's just that I love that there's this um, story that I got from Jonathan Streeter, who runs Think Around, Thinker of Thoughts. Uh, YouTube channel page and a uh, blog. Great thinker, great thinker of many thoughts. And he has this great article called steel tools versus wood tools. I bring it up literally in every discussion that I ever have with somebody. So if anyone was paying attention, they watched on the interviews, 
this is the bingo thing of like Kara mentions that. Um, Got to mention like sex abuse, thinker of thoughts, article about steel tools, and then like something about Jesus, maybe. Oh, weed. We haven't gotten into like other things, but those are all on my like nuance ho interview bingo charts. If anyone wants to know. Anyway, point is, um, he he brings up this idea of like Thomas Edison. And he had some wild number, like 8,000 or something different filaments that he was trying to use to get the light bulb to ignite and stay lit. And just that idea that like when you, you know, for sure when something's working and not working, whether the light bulb's turning on or whether it's not, you know, over it's off, it is, it's night and day, no pun intended. Right. (laughs) And he's saying like, you know, when something is making it light up and when it's not lighting up and then, you know, which ones to discard and what to not go back to. And once I read that and I was like, that is the perfect analogy for the church. You know, when it's not lighting up anymore and it like, it just is burnt out and there's not a single other one that you can find in the immediate area that's going to make it light. But you definitely know not to ch- try the ones you've already tried. <laughs> like those are off the table. We don't need those anymore. And so like you're in this space of like this faith crisis space where you're, you're like, I don't know what's true. I don't know if I should. Because I, I, when I my shelf first broke, I was like kind of excited because I was like, okay, I can go to a real Christian church. Like I've been trying right. to be Christian all deep down. And I couldn't even go to a single one, I think, because I was just researching them. And I'm like ah, but you hold, like everyone held to the Bible too strongly. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, it was only like the, like the universalist Methodist church or whatever that was like, you know, they have like their gay flag or they're like, you know, pride flag is up on that side of their building. And I was like, they seem all right. But everybody else, I was just like, I just don't feel like even this whole system is going to work anymore. Like nothing is lighting up for me. Nothing is telling me that this is the path I should be going down. And that's heartbreaking. You're like, I don't know where to go, but it's definitely not back in that building. Or any of the ones that look like it. You know. Yeah, it's it's definitely terrifying when you feel your whole world and identity crumbling underneath you and you're just like, ugh. Like you said, it's it's fun and exciting in some ways, but then you're like, okay, where do I land? Which leads me to, so then what did light you up besides weed? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect way to <laughs> um That came later. Uh, Weed, if anyone wants to say she left so that she could smoke weed, there would be truth to that if my first weed experiences were good, but they actually weren't. And it was an acquired taste that I had to get used to. But anyway, um, it was a struggle for a really long time. Um, I kind of, this is 2019. I kind of just went down the the atheist track that many of us do when we leave the church. And my definition of atheism is just, it's kind of an all encompassing, like I don't pray to a God. I don't believe in a God. Nothing is, uh, you know, met my, my standard of evidence for needing to worship something. So um, I know people like define God in many, many different ways and many beautiful ways that I really like. Um, And um, I, I had to just reinterpret the kind of sin based model like this uh you're born at a deficit and you're going to need to like be repaying god and worship him for the rest of your life i had to replace that model uh with something better and like a new earth and eckhart tolle books right off the bat um it helped me shift my understanding of who i was in the world in relationship to everything around me um and everyone around me um in a really healthy way And you still want to be like, be just because you leave Mormonism doesn't mean that you want to leave kind of working on yourself. You know what I mean? Like there's still, you you just need to know what's, what's a healthy boundary to set. And there's so many big questions. I think like one of the biggest questions leaving Mormonism is like, how good of a person should I be now? (laughs) Like, (laughs) how do I find my own like intrinsic sense of morality? Like, how do I know what's right or wrong? And like, all I'm swear to God, like all of the, all of those answers will just come from within. Like, I think we're all made to understand that it's in our evolution. It's in just this natural sense of community that we've evolved with. Like the answers to all of those things, people, like I got bent out of shape trying to figure out. I know people do trying to figure out who they are in this world, what their relationship to people should be, how they should go about acting and like going, you know, practicing meditation and going inward I found all of the answers, like everything. If you do that enough and you, I, 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 I feel like, um, psychedelics for me were like 
the locker room of life where like the life, the game out there is going to be played and you're going to be getting beat up. And if you don't have time to, whether it's like meditation or yes, like weed or whatever, where you can take a step back to go into the locker room and really analyze your performance and get in a space where you're really able to be like, have less of an ego about things and just feel the the same connection to that I did when I was a Christian of just like, how can I love people better? Where am I not showing up for people? Where am I not keeping my word? Um, because like I was saying, like, just because you leave Mormonism doesn't mean that you just, you know, wallow in, in despair all the time. And I, I like to be proactive and I'm like wallowing over. How do we care? What do we need to do now so that we are still the best versions of ourselves? And Mormon trolls would get on here and they would say, Kara, you're the worst version of yourself right now. And I disagree. <laughs> I love the locker room thing. I think that's so perfect. Um, because, yeah, it's it really is a reset, like a hard reset. I am a huge advocate for psychedelics or really anything that will bring you to consciousness and awareness like we were talking about. And I love how you said that, that all of a sudden – you just realized, oh, I have all of the answers within me. It's all here. I just need to go within and find it for myself. And that's really the whole point of what we're trying to do here. And what, what I'm trying to help share with people is you don't have to find the answers outside of yourself. Maybe you take a mushroom that is outside of yourself to go within yourself if you need that help, <laughs> that assistance. Mm -hmm. Or you can skip all of the psychedelics and do meditation, like you said, yoga, any sort of practice that will bring you back into who you really are without having to put all of the answers to your own life in someone else's hands because that's silly. Yes. You don't need to do that. Oh, can I tell a story that I just thought of that I yes. think will go perfectly here? Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if I've told this story anywhere before. Fun. I'm exclusive. It's not that great, but um, – <laughs> Uh, I was, I was born at home. Mom, my mom had all of us at home. Oh, wow. Um, a lot of great things that I love about home birth and, um, that process that I was talking about earlier, like growing up and getting married and having kids, it all kind of culminated around me eventually, like being a mom. And there's so, so much that I love about motherhood. And it's one of those things like a Christian I could say is written on my heart, um, is, is nurturing children and like growing growing a child, praying over them every single day. And then the process of giving birth, um, I always knew was going to be really special because my mom always told me about my birth story growing up. And it was a great way that we bonded. And I've always loved that about just women's capacity to, to do that and create this, this bond with kids. So, um, I knew that I was going to have like natural births and home births and stuff. And, uh, my first two births with my daughter were, like the most insanely spiritual experiences of my life. And I did so much spiritual work in a, in a Mormon context, um, trying to like, I, I had these different affirmations from the Bible. I read books about like Christian, like Christian home birthing, basically <laughs> about like getting yourself in the space where like your headspace is the affirmation that like, this is what God wants you to do right now. Like his angels surround you, like, you know, nothing harder than like going through a contraction. You're like, where do I grab? Where do I grab for peace and hope and strength that I'm going to be able to get through this contraction contraction and using like my Christianity to do it is how I did my first and second daughter's birth. And my second daughter's birth especially was really beautiful. And it, uh, I literally, while I was like, uh, those were not home births. Those were at the hospital, but the second one was in a tub at the hospital. And while they're like wheeling me through the hospital corridors and stuff, I'm listening to like, like Jesus, like evangelical, like, like what's the word? Just like Christian music. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I listened to the same three songs when I gave birth to my, my first daughter and my, I listened to the same three Christian songs on repeat for hours on end, just concentrating on these lyrics of like, the strength that God is giving me right now is what I'm trying to explain. Like by his grace, I am like, I am put in this place to bring this new spirit, this new child in the world. And like, it's going to be great. That kind of idea. And one of the hardest things to come to terms with when I kind of stopped believing in that God and the day that like my Christian shelf broke of like, Oh, that was me the whole time. And it was that you know, you know, you have to like take the sour with the sweet. You have to take the good with the bad compliment sandwiches, you know, 
hardest thing I ever came to terms with is that at least that God doesn't exist. Probably none of them, you know, (laughs) but that satisfaction of going, oh my gosh, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And it was easy because I was able to get myself in a mindset. It was me the whole time. (laughs) It was me the whole time that fucking showed up. It was me the whole time, you know? And then I had my, my third son I had during COVID in my living room and this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful birth in my living room in a tub there and going through the contractions. And at one point I'm leaning over the tub with my husband and I, and it's hard. Like the, there's nothing like, there's so many few situations in your life where you cannot give up. Like, even if you're like hiking Mount Everest, you still could technically like turn around, you know, there's so few instances like parenting is one you can't give up. Like even marriage or college or a job, like in the middle of giving birth, there's nothing you want to do more than just like exit, please give up. But your brain has to find something to hold on to, to make you keep going. You know, like you just, you have to. And I just remember thinking like, I can't do this. Like I want to give up so bad. And I just felt weaker during my, my, my son's, my, my atheist birth. And I felt so weak. And I started crying on my husband's shoulder during one of these contractions. And I was like, I don't think that I can give birth um, without believing in God. And then my husband is just like, obviously the sweetest and the smartest. And he's like, reminds me of like, but you did that, Kara. Like you, God wasn't there. (laughs) Like you still did that. Like you have to pull that out of you now. And then I get like this ultra, like just like maternal feminism, like crazy on fire, like Hulk mania. (laughs) And then I like, I literally like my husband can attest. I screamed that baby out of me. Like I got it done. And I was so, you know, because I was finally able to take ownership because so much of Christianity and so much of what I was taught is like, all glory be to God. Like I am, but a servant, like I am, but just able to, I'm just so grateful that he just gives me his little nectar that I'm able to even just like bask in his love and his guidance and stuff. But owning that, I'm like, Oh, the hard things, the hardest things that can be done in life. I can do them. And That if you want to talk about like awakening to consciousness, like giving birth without believing in the Christian God or the Mormon God anymore and like finding my own power. That was like, and my husband, he probably brings it up every single day. He's like, remember when you gave birth to Cal and that was the coolest thing I've ever seen? I was like, heck yeah. (laughs) So that is amazing. I love that so much. And I I love that you brought that up because I've been thinking about birthing a lot recently because I'm engaged. Yay. Um, And so birthing a wedding or birthing a child, birthing a child. Um, So we've been talking about having kids and I also want to do the natural birth thing, like the hypnosis type of deal in the tub and all of that. And so it's so great to be able to hear that from you. And it's so empowering. So thank you for sharing that because, man, I can only imagine the the physical, spiritual, mental transformation that you went through in that moment when you said, oh, I gave away all of my power and I'm going to take it all back right in this moment as I bring a child into this world. That is incredible. <sighs> yeah. And to be honest, it it is something I think about every single day because I I am an, I am a naturally lazy person. I don't work out. I kind of eat what I want. I'm I'm lazy in a lot of respects, all right? But I have this post-it next to my bed that I look at every everything that just paints colors everything of the way I live my life. And it just says uh anything is possible with the proper motivation. And that's just reminds me of like giving birth like if you're motivated enough by like a child coming out of you and you, you have to fucking go. Like it's go time. Like, no, there is no, you have to be motivated. (laughs) Yeah. So find what's going to motivate you to be able to get there. So like the goal that I needed to reach was like, don't lose your, cause every, every moment of giving birth is literally like, don't lose your shit. Don't lose your shit. Don't lose your shit. Just like breathe, 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 you know? And then, so the, the motivation is don't lose your shit and push this child out. And don't just like collapse and die. Cause that's what you think is going to happen sometimes <laughs> <laughs> coupled with like, what do I need to focus on? What is the small grain of like, what, what's going to get me there? And so like that motivation of getting through my, my faith crisis is like, I can't, well, I can't, can't cry in bed for another moment because like my love for my kids motivates me to get out of bed and just keep going and 
day after day, just putting the work. Same thing when I'm giving birth. Like my motivation at that moment was like, I have to take back my power because there's nothing else left to grab from. Like you've tried everything else. There's nothing else to grab a hold of. So what better than to just at this moment, go as, go as deep into your, your brain and your body and your heart and soul and muster up some strength that you never knew that you had before. Like that's what giving birth means to me (laughs) in a way. And that's what like a faith crisis at the same, at the same time does. Like I didn't mean to say it so poetically, but like life is all about like mustering up strength in yourself that you didn't know that you had until you're put in the situation to do it. And like I said, with proper motivation, there's something like that just needs to get done and your life depends on it. It gets done. And now I use that to like make stupid little TikToks every day. Like I have to do them. Like that's perfect. I was actually just going to say, okay, so what motivates you now? I know we're um, just about out of time. What motivates you now to spread all of your knowledge and um, all of your little snippets through humor and comedy to the world? Um, well, what motivates me? It's, it's a complicated factor. Um, I, at my, if I, if I was to boil it all down, it is because I have become acutely aware of the suffering in the world created by cults, whether you want to call them like high demand religions, um, by just suffocated ways of thinking that hinder not only the person with the wrong idea, but then the people around them that bleed out into every factor of their life in the ways that they vote and the way that they process things. And I mean, if you think in terms of like the kind of stuff that the new earth talks about or like Eckhart Tolle does or anything that I have to recognize that the old ways of doing things have to die away. Not only like, do I hope they die away or they need to like (laughs) people like our, our, our species cannot continue with the old models of how we've been doing things, the old narratives that we've been telling ourselves, the old ways that we've been treating the earth, the old ways that we have been exploitive of one another, whether that's through labor or through um, emotional immaturity, whatever. I'm like, all I can say is like, it is a big picture that this earth has a lot of suffering in it. And I'm acutely aware that it needs it, it needs more joy in it and it needs more people waking up to it. And so that is like my niche is the lane of giving people laughter while they're also breaking away of like the old systems of the past that aren't serving our civilization anymore. I think that's, hope that made sense. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to do it because when you make someone laugh, they're a lot more open to hearing the information that you're presenting to them rather than shutting off or feeling like they're being lectured. Um, so I think you you really tapped in and you figured out the way to kind of open people's eyes in a, a fun, unique way to where people can actually learn the information and hopefully change and, and all that will ripple out, as you said, in a positive way. Right. And my big, if anyone wants to help me with this conundrum, all the answers will come within, trust me, if I meditate on it, or the easy answers could come if I just like pull my Instagram audience, which is like what I'm about to do. <laughs> It's because I, because I got a comment last night from somebody who said like, this is quickly turning into an atheist channel. And, you know, he told me all the things I already know. Like, I mean, that's kind of like getting comments from people 101 is like, you think I don't know this already, obviously. But he's like, you need to stay, you need to stay less. You need to talk about your politics less. You need to not come off as a liberal. You need to not come off as this way, which is ironic because I just did a video about how important authenticity is in a post-Mormon space. Um, so the whole, the whole thing I'm trying to say right now is like, I, I could take my content in a lot of different ways. And all I've been doing so far is just, um, pushing on the pedal of what I know I would have listened to like three years ago when I was conservative and still Mormon, but had a sense of humor. And so it's a really, the hardest part is like what to be funny about. I could make jokes about anything. I could make jokes that just, like, you know, hardened commie atheists love. Like, I could do that all day. Or I could make jokes that just, like, conservative Mormons like. That people wouldn't even know that I lost my faith. Because I'm just, like, lightly dancing around these topics. And that will get more people in. And I was like, there's laughter. Laughter could come from a lot of different places. It just depends on, like, 
what will the, what will appeal to the most amount of people and what do I think is the funniest? And that's like a hard formula to work out. I'm just telling you, mm-hmm. like, while it may all seem fun in games, it does, it does keep me up at night about what I want to make content about. What do I want to satirize? And who do I want to not offend <laughs> while still <laughs> good luck <laughs> staying authentic? Yeah. Good luck, Kara. Right. So it's hard. You can't like please everybody. Um, but so far, my guiding principle is, yeah. What would I have laughed at a couple years ago? And I have to make sure that I keep blonde hair because I only would have listened to basic bitches like myself. Like, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh my gosh, you're so funny. Well, I totally get the content creation struggle. I myself have been doing it for a while and it's tricky and it's hard and you can't please everyone, but I think you're doing a killer job. So for anyone who's listening, where can they find all of this killer content? Give me all the platforms. Um, First and foremost, speaking of feminism, I'm with it. I'm on board with it. I am trying to be the breadwinner of my household. <laughs> so if you feel so inclined uh, you can go to patreon.com slash nuanceo, and that is a great, like, reoccurring monthly donation, like $5 at a time or $25 um, that comes in, and that just enough people that come in like that, that really helps me pay my bills. So I always love to plug my Patreon, and you get special perks on that, like behind the scenes content, and all of my YouTube videos are available in audio podcast form on that. Then I have a YouTube channel, Nuanceo. And I po I, I make my TikToks under new one so and then I repost as many good ones as I feel like. So my YouTube channel has longer format me talking about interesting concepts. Um sometimes by myself, sometimes with guests. Um and then I have post my my silly little TikToks on there too, um, that are popular and that that helps, you know, pay the bills a little bit too. So anyone who's like, I'm with you, Kara. I have never heard of you before. You can go binge that, like everything, comment for the algorithm, subscribe, and I will be super happy. And then I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. And I'm just plugging away every day, just kind of whatever's in the news, whatever I think is interesting, whatever concepts I feel like need to be whether satirized or talked about, usually relating to Mormonism, trying to not come off too much like a you know dead inside nihilist commie atheist I'm really trying to like like you know lean into like my psychedelic uh peace love everything is good vibrations we're all gonna be okay even though I know we're not (laughs) so (laughs) that's what you'll get I think if you just remain authentic that could be anything it could be nihilistic one day it could be peace and love the next day just do what's authentically you crying into my phone Chalice is not going to be popular (laughs) just be like (laughs) (laughs) there's probably an audience for that somewhere it's true Uh, well thank you so much for joining me it's been so much fun fun talking to you and uh yeah I look forward to connecting with you soon again always a pleasure thank you girl thanks for listening If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.